Today I want to camp out in this chapter of Galatians. Uh, In Galatia, there's a crisis happening in the church in Galatia. And Paul is writing to them to address this crisis. Uh, This is a church that, that Paul himself started. Paul was a church planter, and he went into Galatia and preached the good news about Jesus. And this church began after the preaching of the good news about Jesus. Uh, Paul taught there how Jesus saves by grace through faith and that this salvation is not because of your own works, but it's a free gift of God so that no one can brag about their salvation unless they want to brag about the cross of Jesus. And it was shared here in Galatia that the blood of Jesus is enough to wash you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It was taught in Galatia that Jesus saves completely. And it was taught here that those who were Gentiles, non-Jews, by birth, needed only to believe in Jesus to be saved. They did not have to become culturally Jewish first, following Jewish law, before they could be saved. They didn't need to first be circumcised and become Jewish to then become Christian. They were saved by Christ alone. And this is good news for us too. It's good news that we don't have to become something else to become Christian first. I don't need to look at what is acceptable culturally to see how I can know and be known by God. I need only to look to Jesus. I don't need the approval of those around me to know that I'm loved by God. I need only to look to Jesus. I don't need to listen to what seems appropriate at the time to be adopted into the family of God. I need only to look at Jesus. There's an old gospel hymn called Only Look at Jesus. In the song, it says this, Only look at Jesus, O soul bowed down with care. He has promised to defend me and heal all my burdens share. Only look at Jesus. He is merciful and true. Through storm and through clouds and through trials, he'll lead you safely through. Only look, only look, turn away from sin. One look, one look, salvation bring eternal life to win. See, all you have to do is look to Jesus to be saved. But in just a short time after Paul preached this message in Galatia, there have been people who have come into this young church seeking influence and seeking to impress the Jewish leaders in the area. And so they came in and distorted the the message of the gospel of Jesus. And they began to preach circumcision as a means to salvation. That you can have Jesus, but you got to follow Jewish custom first. And so Paul had to write the church in Galatia and remind them, you've come this far by faith. Turn to your neighbor and say, I can't turn around. Uh, See, the the first year after I was married, I had the the blessing of attending my first uh, Thanksgiving with my wife's family in Texas. Uh, My first black Thanksgiving, praise God. And... uh, (laughs) The seasoning was pouring through the pores of the house, okay? It was <laughs> wafting through the seals of the windows, and uh, praise God. <laughs> Y'all have felt the anointing before. I can, I can see that. Um, and uh, before uh, we ate the meal, my wife's family gathered around the living room and, ga- and joined hands, and they sang, hey, let's sing the family song before we eat the meal. And they began to sing. I, I just sat silently, which y'all, some of y'all are about to do. Uh, But this is what they begin to sing. They sing, we've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. He hasn't failed me yet. Ready? And oh, can't turn around. We've come this far by faith. Hey, man, give me some round of applause. You got, you got to say, I can't turn around. Like, when you know you can't go back, you, gotta, you can't say can't. I can't turn. You add an I in there because I can't turn around. Amen? Yeah. So <laughs> Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, and I think he wants to tell us today, too, that you have come where you are by faith. Not because of your works, but through faith in Jesus has brought you to where you are. And you can't turn around. Amen? The first thing I I think Paul wants to show us today in in this 
this journey of walking by faith, of not turning around, that you've come this far by faith, is that number one, there is power in standing up. There is power in standing up. You see, uh, he tells us in verse 1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. There's power in standing up. You see, the power of standing has actually been taking the world by storm in the past five years. Uh, A few years ago, headlines began to swirl uh, with the statement that sitting is the new smoking. As studies came out detailing uh, the the inactive lifestyles of Americans and how we often sit for crazy hours of the day. Studies have shown that people who sit for eight hours a day are at a wildly increased risk for many health issues, even earlier death because you're sitting. Standing up has been catching tons of positive attention in light of this reality. There are things like standing desks. There are things like adjustable desks if you want to sit sometimes and stand other times. There are things like uh, desk um, treadmills that you can put under your desk and walk while you're working. We even have watches now that alert you that you've been, stand, you've been sitting still for too long because we need to learn to stand up. And this is important in our faith life as well, that we're not called to sit down in our faith but to stand up. And so Paul writes to the church in Galatia, encouraging them. Hey, you need to stand up. He tells the church in Galatia this. He also tells the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God. So when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. He writes to the church in Corinth in chapter 16. Be on alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be Strong. He writes to the church in Philippi in chapter 4, Therefore, my beloved brethren, in this way stand firm in the Lord. And again in chapter 1, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. You see, we're called to stand in our faith. He says that Jesus has freed you. Freed us from what? He's freed us from sin, but in this particular text, there was something else that we were freed from. We were freed from the confines of the law. That the law of God, we have been freed from working according to the law to obtain favor from God. We've been freed from following the law to be accepted by God. In Christ, Christ perfectly obeyed the law of God and died in our place, therefore giving us his perfection and taking our brokenness on him. So we've been freed from having to be perfect because in Jesus we are made perfect. And he says, so because of that, stand in Christ's perfection. Why are you putting a yoke of slavery on again? Why are you trying to go back to the law thinking it will save you when it never could? So he says, stand firm. But there's some things you got to know to be able to stand up. There's some things you got to know to be able to stand in your faith. The first thing you got to know is that we can stand up because Jesus stood up. The only way you have any power on your own to stand in your faith is because Jesus got up out of the grave and stood in victory. You see, apart from Christ, Ephesians 2 tells us that we are dead in our sins and trespasses. And I can tell you one thing a dead person never does. Stand up. If they do... Get out of there. If you're at a funeral and the dead person stands up, I listen, I, I don't need the meal afterwards. I'm not going to the repast. I'm going home and locking the door, okay? The zombie apocalypse has happened. But you have the power to stand in your faith because Jesus is alive. That's why you have the power to stand up. The second thing you need to know to be able to stand spiritually is that standing requires a firm foundation. You can't stand on something that can't bear your weight. That didn't hit some of y'all. So I'm going to tell you about my life, okay? My struggle. Uh, There's this thing that they have created to make parents suffer. It's called a trampoline park. (laughs) Some of y'all have experienced this torment. I I can see 
you'll have a, a trampoline testimony in your life, okay? And I've taken my kids to the trampoline park, and it looks amazing. You sign your kid's life away at the door for $15. Whatever happens, like I'll, it's on me. I got it. I just, just throw them through the air, okay? And so you see toddlers just flying across the place. It's amazing. And there's this one area of the trampoline park called the foam pit. Uh-huh. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And standing on the outside of the foam pit, it looks amazing. Because you see like 50-pound six-year-olds jumping in there, and they just float on the breeze, and they just be swimming out of the foam pit. It looks amazing. But then my big behind gets over there. And I think that being 40 years old, all the 200 pounds with ACLs just hanging on for dear life, <laughs> that I'm going to jump into the foam pit and have a great time. Okay? And the world was like, that ain't going to happen over here. There's nothing for you over here in this foam pit. And so I jump in the foam pit. And for... An amazing moment of time, I am just like fully visible, everyone can see the grandeur that's happening, and then in a matter of a blink of an eye, I completely disappear in the foam. I'm nowhere to be seen. And, I, and at that point, I'm still having a good time. I'm like, ah, oh, that was great. I landed great. I, nothing's injured. I'm good. But then I tried to get out. And y'all, praise God there were no cameras in that place. Because I, every step of, I mean, have y'all been in one of these before? It's miserable. Like, this is what hell is like. And so I'm taking steps, and every time I reach for a different, first of all, it's disgusting. It's just a pit full of sponges. That's all that is. And they never sanitize that joint, ever, in your life. And so I'm wading through disease and whatever. Listen, y'all know. That mask don't help you in a foam pit. You're covered. And every time I would reach to grab something, I would sink back down. Every time I would take a step, I would sink further down. This is what it's like trying to stand on your faith without Jesus. This, this is a spiritual reality of trying to stand in life and remain unshaken apart from a relationship with Jesus. Because everything you think you can stand on fails you. And it can't bear under your weight. That job, it ain't forever. That relationship, they're going to blow it. Your kids aren't going to do what you want them to. That raise may not come. That promotion may never happen. All the things you say, well, if I could just get footing on this, you fall. So to stand up, you got to have a firm foundation. And thirdly, if you want to, you, you got to be able to stand up before you can step out. <laughs> if you're not standing, how can you take your next step? So you, you got to have a firm foundation to be able to stand, and you can't take a next step in your faith or in life if you aren't already standing. How, how can you keep in step with the Spirit unless you're standing up? How can you walk out your salvation with fear and trembling unless you're standing up? How can you soar on wings like eagles? How will you run and not grow weary? How will you walk and not be faint unless you are first standing up? See, some of you are in here today, and you're wondering why you can't get to that next spot in your life. You're wondering why is that next step keep delaying? Well, what are you standing on? Are you standing on something firm? Are you standing on a relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ? Are you even standing up? Maybe the weight of life has weighed you down. Maybe you're allowing the cares of the world to keep you pinned down, and God's saying, hey, I have the power to stand you up, and I have the ability to get you where you're going next. But you got to be standing if you want to take your next step. Paul says, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and don't go back to a yoke of slavery. The second thing we see Paul say is not just that it takes power to stand, but number two, that your effort doesn't elevate you. Your efforts don't elevate you. See, in America, we love the story of the self-made person, don't we? Somebody who got it out the mud, uh, who didn't rely on anybody, who, who came up from the gutter. The only problem with the story is it's fictional. <laughs> there is not a self-made person alive. Nobody didn't have somebody. And if you feel that way, you are ignorance on fire. 
Because somewhere, somebody was saying your name in a room you never existed. Somewhere, some, somebody, God put somebody to hold you up when you just couldn't go on anymore. <laughs> There's no one who didn't have somebody give them a shot or help them take a step forward. But we keep the idea out there. We keep it out there. And the enemy loves it. The enemy loves the idea of the self-made person because it keeps us grinding. It keeps us moving. I just got to keep hustling out here because nobody's doing anything for me. And God's like, you don't even see how many things are happening for you right now. But this idea was alive in Galatia too. It was alive in Galatia, this idea of I want to do something to prove my value. And Paul says in verse 2, he says, look, it's me, Paul, writing this. So to, to, to say to you, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again that every man who accepts circumcision or everybody that tries to live according to the law, that he is obligated to keep the whole law. What that tells us is that relying on the power of our own effort removes any benefit of Jesus. Relying on the power of our own efforts removes any benefit we had in Jesus. You see, the benefit that we have in Jesus is that our standing before God has nothing to do with our own works. If you want to be recognized for your good works before God, you better be perfect. And not just perfect in action, perfect in motivation. You can't just be perfect in what you did. You've got to be perfect in why you did it. And not just perfect in motivation. You've got to be perfect in timing. When did you do it? Was it the right time? It requires perfection to stand before God. I, th this is what keeps me sprinting to Jesus. Because I get the wrong timing, the wrong motivation, and the wrong action. I just get it wrong. So I need Jesus' perfection. Because he's always on time. He always wants to please the Father, and he always does what is good, right, and perfect. He does everything well. And so I go to Jesus for my standing before God. And even if you're here today, okay, and you're, because listen, we, sin makes us so proud. Because I'm a good person. I, I do good things for people. But Isaiah 64 says, even if you do good stuff, all of us have become like one who's unclean. And all our righteous acts, all of our good stuff is like filthy rags before a perfect God. Even your good stuff ain't as good as God. We need help, y'all. We need help to break free from the things that are holding us back. And Jesus offers it. What we really want is we want all of the credit and none of the blame. Are there any office fans in the room? Any office fans? It's a few, it's a few people that love the Lord, okay? There's this show called The Office, okay, and it's a paper company, and there's a boss in this paper company, a, a regional manager, if you will, named Michael Scott. And Michael has a great idea one time to offer discounts to their paper customers. And so he goes into the warehouse, and just like Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, he takes golden tickets, and he places golden tickets, which are a percentage discount, inside the boxes of paper to be distributed amongst their clients so that people get, could get a surprise discount on their paper. What he failed to realize is that he put them in different boxes all on the same pallet. And so when the pallet got shipped off, it went to the same company. And the coupons didn't say only one coupon per client. And it happened to go to their biggest client ever. So their biggest contract is getting a, a severe discount. In fear and worry of what's going to happen to him, he turns to his assistant, the assistant to the regional manager, Dwight Schrute. And he says, Dwight, you've got to take the blame for me. I want, you've got to take the blame for this problem. And so he convinces Dwight to sit there and take the blame. And so a phone call is coming from corporate. And so Michael and Dwight are sitting by the phone. Corporate calls. And they say, hey, whose idea was this for this discount? And Dwight says, it was mine, waiting for the punishment to fall. And he says, well, the company called, and they were so amazed by the discount, they decided to give all of their business to us. <laughs> what the devil meant to harm you, huh? 
Yeah, even on the office. So he says, Dwight, that was a fantastic idea. Michael says, uh, that was my idea. And the boss says, hey, what am I supposed to do with this? What do you want, Michael? And Michael says, I want all of the credit and none of the blame. That's us. We want all the credit for every good work and none of the blame for every bad work in our life. But this is only possible with Jesus. You see, in Jesus, we don't just get the credit for our good works. We get the credit for his good works. And, he, and the blame that of our bad works get placed upon him. He transitions our badness to him and his goodness to us. It's called, if y'all want to write this down, it's called imputed righteousness. Come on, 50 cent word. He puts his righteousness on to us. We get all his credit and he takes all of our blame. But you see, trying to do, get righteousness by the works of the law, this is what Paul says in verse 4. He's talking about circumcision. Y'all know what that is. If you don't, Google's your friend, all right? But they're talking about cutting off a certain piece of flesh. Paul says if you want to cut that off, verse 4, then you are severed from Christ. He says, well, I'll, I'll do some wordplay. You cut that and you're cut off from Christ. You who would be justified or made right by your works. Verse 5 says, for through the Spirit, by faith, we Christians eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. You see, Paul's saying that if you're depending on your works, you think you can obtain righteousness by what you do. But Paul says Christians don't do that. Christians know our righteousness is yet to come. So we wait for our righteousness. Yeah. See, we know that we are, we're made, we are in right standing before God now. And that the process of sanctification makes us righteous as we live day by day with Jesus. But we wait. One day we'll be made completely right. Stand before God forever. And so we don't work for our righteousness as Christians. We wait for our righteousness. Paul is saying, hey, y'all are doing it the wrong way. You want to work for it? you got to work for your whole life. But I'll, us over here, Christians, through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly await the hope of our righteousness. And this is, this is helpful to us because the third thing I want to see is that we all get knocked down. All of us get knocked down. So we can't look at these Galatians who, who all of a sudden want to, by their own efforts, somehow get close to God because all of us get knocked down. Verse 7 says, hey, Galatians, you were doing so well. You were running really well. What changed? What, what's hindering you from obeying the truth? Verse, verse 8 says, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. That just basically means, hey, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. Some bad teaching has got in and has begun to seep through everybody. I read it in a leadership book recently that said, um, negative attitudes poison teams. So you got to isolate, oh, praise God. you got to isolate negativity. I'm going to talk till it comes back, praise God. You have to isolate negative people or else their attitudes will infect everyone. And so you have to watch how you, and so this bad teaching has come in to the church and he's begun to, in, hallelujah, has been. <laughs> you see, Paul's writing this letter, and he says, hey, I don't know who's persuading you this way, but a little bad teaching could poison everybody. Verse 10, he says, I have confidence not in y'all, but in the Lord, that you won't take any other view, and the one who's troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, he's, he's basically saying, hey, I don't preach circumcision. If I were preaching it, why would they still hate me? I preach the cross of Christ, he says. Verse 12, and this is spicy language, he says, I wish those of you who, those who unsettle you or those who are teaching circumcision would just go ahead and emasculate themselves. They want to they talk about cutting stuff? Go ahead and cut. Go ahead and cut. You see, Paul knows this church. He knows the faces of the people he's writing to. He, he knows the names of the people he's writing to. He knows how God saved them. And he knew how they were doing when he left the church. He says, y'all were doing so good. What's going on? And I'm here to tell y'all, you, you guys know what it looks like to run well. 
You, you've been in seasons of your faith where you were growing exponentially. You've been in seasons uh, where your zeal was just pouring out of you and you couldn't help but tell people about the faith that you had. You've been running well. My question is, what's hindering you? You've run well in the past. You know what it looks like to be close to God. What is it? What's going on? He, he says, hey, I know, I know this persuasion ain't from God. This persuasion isn't from the one who's calling you. So who is it from? What's causing you to shrink back in your faith? What's causing you to doubt God? Where are those voices coming from? Maybe it's people. Maybe it's past wounds. Maybe it's, it's hope deferred that's causing you to, to languish in doubt. But Paul says, I know it's not God. Whatever the voice is that's pulling you back from stepping out in faith, God, Paul says, it's, it's not the voice of God. So be careful who you're listening to. You know what it looks like to run well in your faith. And you also know when you are holding back in your faith. And Paul says, I, I don't want you to do that, but my confidence isn't in your ability to get right. If you're here today and you're struggling in faith, oftentimes we think, what can I do to get better? It's not on you. You, you never initiated your faith. God is the author and perfecter. Author means he started it. Perfecter means he keeps it going. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. So when you struggle in your faith, Paul says, my confidence isn't in your past success or your future ability. My confidence is in the Lord, that you won't take a different view than righteousness through Christ alone. Family, if you're struggling to stand today, I'm confident in you too. I'm confident in you that God lives in you through the power of his Holy Spirit. And he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. My confidence for you is in God. You don't have to stay down. I, you may have been knocked down, but you don't have to stay down. I was watching a, a, a fight again the other day on YouTube. Uh, it's from 2018. There was a heavyweight championship match between uh, Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder. Deontay Wilder's nickname is the Bronze Bomber. Dude's just like jacked, like looks like a statue. And, he, and six, he's like six foot a million, right? And uh, Tyson Fury was, was a great boxer, but had been coming off a season of depression and obesity, and he had to work his way back into the ring. And they're going toe-to-toe, round for round. And they get to the very last round of the fight, round 12, and Deontay Wilder's like throwing these haymakers. And this one right hand connects with Tyson Fury's chin, and Tyson Fury falls to the ground. Deontay Wilder turns to the camera. He's like, ah, it's over. Everybody knows it's done. And all the commentators are, there's no way he gets up. And then just like The Undertaker out of WWE, <laughs> Tyson Fury is just like, Beep. just like stand, sits up, gets up, and fights to a draw in the fight. So there were, he didn't lose the fight. They had a draw. What I'm telling you is, even when it seems like everybody around you is saying, hey, there's no way you can get back up. Through Jesus, there is power to stand back up in your faith. You may have taken the biggest hit of your life recently. There are some people in this place right now who this past month have gotten the biggest hit of their life and feel like they can't get off the mat. And I'm encouraging you today. Paul is encouraging you today. You can stand up in the personal work of Jesus Christ. You can stand back up today in faith, in freedom, and in Jesus. So if that's true, the question I have then that I think the text answers and begs is how do I stay free? If Jesus brings about freedom, then how do I stay free? Verse 13 walks us through this. He says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. I want to walk through th four ways to stay free. Four ways to stay free. Then I'm, I'm in my seat and we're done. Four ways to stay free. Number one, understand that you are called to freedom. You were called to freedom, which means you didn't find freedom on your own. So to stay free, you have to know that you were called to it. And when you understand that you were called to freedom by God, it means you need to stay close to the one who called you. Because freedom, you don't own freedom. 
Freedom owns you. You belong to God. You, you are not your own, but you have been bought with a price. And so you belong to freedom now. Freedom is yours and you are freedoms. And so the way to stay free is to stay close to the one who called you to freedom and defines what freedom is. So if, you want, if you're in a situation where you're like, I, I, I feel bound, I feel, I feel like I can't break free from these things, I need to get free. The, way, the first step to getting free is getting close to the one who calls you to freedom. So understand that you are called to freedom. Secondly, freedom is not to be used. Freedom is not to be used. The text tells us only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for your flesh. We think we can use the freedom God has given us for serving ourselves. And we end up putting shackles back on our hands. You think you're walking in freedom. I'm doing what I want to do. But oftentimes we can't stop doing the things we want to do. And that isn't freedom. That's slavery. So Paul says when you experience this freedom, when God frees you from bondage to sin and freedom to live an abundant life, don't use it for your own selfish gain. Yeah, God's made you free, but when you start using it to serve yourself, you go right back to slavery. He said, hey, don't use it to serve yourself because freedom is to be served. Freedom is meant to be served out. So it's not to be used for ourselves, but it's meant to be served to the people around us. You've been made free to help free others. And you show the level of your freedom when you are using it to help others get free. You know when somebody's free, when they aren't concerned with their self, when they don't have to posture themselves to get authority or position, when they're looking out for the needs of the people around them. You see, freedom calls for you to serve the people around you. You are so free in Christ Jesus, I don't need your approval to be free. A person who doesn't need the approval of the people around them is a free person. I don't need you to affirm me to know that I'm walking in purpose. That's a free person. I don't need you to give me authority in this place to know that I can walk in power. That's a free person. And you show your freedom as you walk in service to those around you. Now, quick caveat. Freedom is not about you only pouring out. Because I feel like I feel some moms in the room maybe who hear like, oh, pastor's just saying just do more stuff for more people. Or I, or I hear some caregivers in the room who are saying, like, I'm, sir, I'm pouring out all the time. That's not freedom either. Because you are bound to service. And why are you serving? Are you serving out of the freedom that God has served you with? Or are you serving to have your value be expressed? Hey, listen, Jesus went and got away to be poured into by God. He said, hey, because Jesus could have served 24 hours a day, seven days a week until he went to heaven. But he said, hey, y'all stay there, leave me alone, so I can go meet with my father. you got to stay close to the one who called you to freedom. If all you do is stay close to the people who need to get free, you won't have any freedom to give. So you need to retreat to be filled back up with the freedom to go unleash out onto the world. We need to understand that there is a flow to freedom. There's a flow to freedom. Jesus gives you freedom in abundance. Not so you can hold it and contain it like a freedom reservoir, but so you can release it as it's poured into you. You're just simply a conduit of freedom. You're here to help announce the coming of the kingdom, that freedom is possible, that deliverance is possible, that you don't have to live bound anymore. You get to announce that with your words and by living free, by asking God to deliver you from what binds you. And so there's a flow to freedom. It doesn't just flow to you. It's meant to, to flow through you to people around you. Uh, the best way I can understand this is through this, um, this idea calling, call it, uh, pay it forward. Y'all ever heard this phrase before, pay it forward? I first encountered this phrase, pay it forward, when I was a drive through worker at Starbucks. So I worked at Starbucks for many years, and I was the drive through guy. Now, the drive through at Starbucks is a whole different world because I can have 300 conversations from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. 
People just flying through that mug. A little bit of Jesus and a whole lot of caffeine. Just, come, just running circles, right? And you can get more stars if you come back this afternoon, right? Okay? They got you. They got you, okay? And so I would have these conversations at Starbucks all day, and this phenomena took over uh, all over Starbucks. It was called pay it forward. What would happen is, y'all have experienced this before, somebody would pull up to the drive-thru, they'd pay their, what, six seventy five dollars for their drink, and they'd say, hey, you know what, let me pay for the person behind me too. I want to pay it forward to the person behind me. So they pay for their drink. Then the next person comes up. And you say, hey, the person in front of you paid for your drink. Would you like to pay it forward to the person behind you? And then they got a decision to make. Because they don't tell you the total first. They say, <laughs> they say well, do you want to pay it? And, you're like, and, and Christians be going crazy. Christians be oh, do I do it? I don't know what to do. Don't let this circle in with me, God. Don't let this circle in with me. Do I pay it forward? <laughs> and there was this competition across America to see which Starbucks could keep the pay it forward line going the longest. And what we found was there was always two reasons why the pay it forward circle stopped. One was, hey, I just don't have enough. That's one reason. And the second reason is, I don't want to. <laughs> Thank you for my drink. Devil, don't steal my blessing. This is, this is for me today, okay? I, the Lord knew I needed this. Passion fruit tea. So the flow of the pay it forward would stop because either I don't have enough or I don't want to. And that's the way the flow of freedom stops too. You stop serving people around you because I don't have enough anymore or because I don't want to. The good news today is, the good news is today that the supplier of freedom, Jesus himself, never runs out of freedom to give you and always wants to. He has an endless supply of freedom for you and an endless desire to give it to you. This is why Jesus is better than me. This is why I need Jesus. And if you're here today and you feel bound up and stuck, God is saying to you, freedom is available. All you got to do is come back to the one who called you in the first place. Come to me. I got all the freedom you need. And guess what? You don't even have to ask me if I want to do it. I've been waiting for you to ask. I got all the want to you could ever imagine. Just come to me. I want to set you free. Why are you living bound? Christians, you do, there are things right now in your life. I want you in your head. Before I go into this closing prayer, I want you in your head. Christians, if you're a believer in the room, what, name the thing that's holding you back. Name, it could be a person, place, thing, experience, something that is keeping you bound that you feel like it's holding you down, that you can't stand up in your faith, you can't take a next step in your faith. And in this, in this closing prayer, I want you to take that thing, if you can find a name for it, I want you to release that to God. God to, to ask God to pour out freedom in that thing. But my fear is that we leave this place and there are people in the room right now who have no idea what freedom even is, who have never said, Jesus, I trust in you. God, will you free me from my sin? And will you free me from trying to earn my position in, world, in the world and in eternity? I'm afraid there's people. So I, I, wanna, I wanna offer an invitation today that today you can experience salvation for the very first time. If you would, all over the room, just every head bowed, every eye closed. Christians, as you are offering that thing that's keeping you bound to God, if you're in the room and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for creating me and for loving me. Even when I've ignored you and gone my own way, I know I need you in my life. I'm sorry for my sins against you and others. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again. 
you are God and I am not. I ask you to forgive me. As much as I know how, I'm ready to change direction by giving you my life. I'm ready to follow you from now on and do what you want me to do. Please come into my life and make me new on the inside. Help me to grow so I can be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your heads bowed just for a second. It, I wonder if anybody prayed that for the first time, would you be so bold just to put your hand up? I don't want to call you out. I just want to get you a Bible, and I want to connect with you with one of our leaders. We got one there. Just keep your hand up until we can find you. We got one there, okay? We got one here. I want to pray. For, we've got one up here in the balcony too. If your heads are still bad, just keep praying for these people that are making decisions. Thank you, God. Let me pray for us one more time. God, we thank you that for these lives that have been changed this morning. God, that you are doing something in this place. We thank you, Lord, that freedom comes from you. God, that you have all the freedom we could ever need and you have all the desire to share it with us. God, I pray for these folks who are making these decisions. You'd help them with their next steps and help us to love and to serve them and pray for them as they continue in this path of faith. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.